I'm going to start by having a lecture on roughly speaking what the problems with quantum theory are. And the next couple of lectures, uh, I'm going to go into more detail on uh, invariable models and uh, cells theory and contextuality. Uh, so let me just start by telling you a little bit about the field of quantum foundations, what sorts of activities uh, happen in the field. And I think, roughly speaking, you can categorize them as these three sorts of things. So there's disagreement about how you should interpret the mathematical formalism of quantum theory. So um, a lot of people are worried about trying to interpret the formalism. Right? You know, what is it exactly saying about the world? So they work on interpretation. Uh, and then there's a set of work which is really just about trying to find phenomena that uh, are difficult to explain from a classical perspective. So Bell's theorem would be an example of this, but also you know, quantum eraser, double slit experiment, long list of things uh, that if you have a classical perspective might seem surprising. And so people work on trying to come up with more such examples. And then finally, uh, particularly in recent years, people have been interested in trying to find some physical principles from which we derive the formalism of quantum mechanics. So this is uh, similar to uh, what happened, oh, I'll rid of those slides. Um, what happened in the context of uh, relativity. So 1905, they already had the Lorentz transformations, uh, but Einstein came up with a couple of physical principles, the light postulate and the relativity postulate, and showed that you could derive the Lorentz transformations from those. And so in a sense, he discovered what the physical significance of the Lorentz transformations were by that kind of derivation. And uh, what we'd like is something similar for the postulates of quantum theory. So the textbook postulates are kind of abstract, and it might be nice to have just a few simple physical principles, and then you derive Hilbert space and the complex field and tensor product and all that stuff from the physical principles. Um, so, so these things are not disconnected. Uh, for example, if you find some new non-classical phenomena, that might be a good candidate for a principle that you could derive the formalism from. So, you know, maybe violations of Bell inequalities, perhaps quantum theory is the only theory that violates Bell inequalities that has some other features. So you might try to elevate any given phenomena to a principle and derive the formalism from that. Um, and also, uh, these days in particular, uh, the first project is informed by the third project. So in the past, people have spent a lot of time trying to sort of add a story to quantum formalism that makes sense. Um, but if you first find a set of principles that are logically independent and from which the formalism follows, then that can guide you to trying to understand what the theory is actually saying. So uh, the interpretation could depend on the axioms you find for the theory. So roughly speaking, that's, that's what goes on. Uh, but where I want to start is just asking, you know, what's, what's the problem with quantum mechanics? Why do we fight about how to interpret it? You know, why can't we just take what it says in the textbooks and go from there? So let me give you uh, kind of a version of the postulates of quantum theory that's kind of distilled out from you know, various textbook presentations. And hopefully, uh, this will be familiar to you. Maybe some of you's first exposure to quantum theory was Nielsen and Chuang, in which case you'll have a slightly different impression of it, but that's fine. Uh, but this is this, this sort of picture you get from uh, physics courses uh, in quantum mechanics. So the first postulate is what I'll call the representational completeness of the quantum state. So it says that the uh, vectors in Hilbert space, or more precisely the rays, because it doesn't matter what the phase is, so the rays in Hilbert space correspond one to one with the physical states of the system. So if you want to know how many ways can the system be, how many physical states, does have, it just corresponds to the different rays of Hilbert space. The second postulate tells you what happens during measurements. It says that uh, if a Hermitian operator A that has spe spectral projectors PK, if there's a pointer, uh, is there a pointer? No? That's fine. I'll just. <laughs> uh, so if, if the Hermitian operator A has some spectral projectors PK, uh, and of course, so, so every measurement is associated with that kind of variation operator, then the probability of outcome k is just the expectation value of that projector pk. And the idea is that the probabilities are objective, that there's nothing in the world that determines which outcome is going to occur. So there's a fundamental objective indeterminism in the theory. 
That's very different from the postulate about how systems evolve when they're isolated. Uh, so that postulate says that the quantum state evolves according to some unitary operator, which is often written <coughs> as exponentiating the Hamiltonian. Uh, and the point is that for a given initial quantum state, oh, thank you. For a given initial quantum state, uh, the final quantum state is fixed. Uh, so it's deterministic evolution. <coughs> Uh, but also it's continuous. As I make the time shorter and shorter, uh, the evolution becomes closer and closer to just identity. OK, uh, and finally, there's, there's a postulate that talks about how systems change as a result of doing a measurement upon them. So it says that uh, if the Hermitian operator A is measured and outcome K is obtained, then the physical state of the system changes discontinuously from whatever it was ahead of time to uh, the projection of that state into the eigenspace associated with this outcome k, renormalized. So we'll just call that psi k. Um, and that's it. That's basically all, all the postulates. So um, rather than telling you what people have said might be problematic with this starting point, I will open the floor for you guys to tell me what's the matter with this. Is there anything to be upset about or uh, maybe unhappy? with concerning these postulates. How do I mean? No, measurement. Oh, it. measurement. <laughs> uh, what's the problem with measurement? Well, I guess the problem is the fact you have two evolution postulates. Right? You have two different ways in which it's evolved. One is diagnostic, one is. And there's no real clear definition of what measurement is. Anyway. Right. So yeah, one thing you can say is, the postulates haven't really told you when you should consider evolution to be of this sort, and when you should say that something is a measurement. Do you have some criteria for when a particular interaction is a measurement interaction, or what it isn't? Yep? No, nothing's really isolated, so the whole universe should be a measurement. So you're saying the, when you say nothing's really isolated, it seems like you're saying only the universe is really isolated. Yeah. So, so the only thing which evolves deterministic instantaneously is the whole universe. Um, okay, well, what if somebody said, well, true, but you know, approximately speaking, I could have a spin in my lab that's isolated, and therefore, you know, approximately, that's going to evolve by unitary. So it has more applicability than just the whole universe. Um, would you then say, okay, there's no problem, or? There's a point where you measure it, then you're comparing the universe to the universe. It's certainly not isolated. Right. 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 So, so the defender of these postulates would say, and that's why we have this separate uh, postulate to tell us what happens when we're doing a measurement. Because so the main thing is that if your lab is an isolated system, then the, that lab should be evolving unitarily, unitarily, whereas this little bit, this ion that you've measured, has collapsed, it's um, evolved discontinuously. It seems to be some difficult to reconcile and get if you look at it on different scales. Right. Right. I exactly. That it seems like how you choose to carve up your system of matters for whether the evolution is deterministic or not. If you say my system is just the spin and it's undergoing a measurement, then I use postulate two and conclude that this thing is going to evolve indeterministically. But if I say no, I'm going to consider the everything in my lab uh, and assign a quantum state to that, if the whole lab is isolated, then postulate Three seems to say that it's evolved deterministically. And on the face of it, it looks like those two things contradict each other. Any other problems? <coughs> just just sign itself seems like a much more complicated object than a principle physical state. Complicated how? It's not observable, yeah. So the fact that it's not observable <coughs> might make you think twice about this first postulate, I guess. That, that's, that's what you're getting at there, I guess. That, um, so the idea is that this thing, the, the quantum state, describes the physical state of the system, but it's very different from the kind of things that usually describe physical states of the system. So 
possibly I might have you know electromagnetic field or particle positions describing the physical state of the system. And if I take many particles, then the size, the dimension of the space of possibilities for the physical states um, is just you know the say the dimension of, of one of these guys to the power n, however many systems uh, uh, I have. Or no, sorry, I should say. Um, yeah, no, that, that's not right. That's, so if I have if I have sort of d possibilities for the first guy, d possibilities for the second guy, and so on, uh, then I have uh, n times d possibilities for the composite. Whereas in quantum theory, I, if I have a d-dimensional, finite dimensional over space for each guy, then I have d to the n dimensions for the full system. And so the scaling of the, the number of physical states in the quantum case is very different from the scaling in the classical case. And that might lead you to think that there could be something wrong with this posture. I don't understand why there's something wrong with psi and other things. I mean, surely in classical physics, loads of things aren't really observable. Like, you can't observe the charge in a particle, you can measure the force between two other particles. You can't observe the curvature of space time, you can measure the deviation of the constraint parts. Isn't it in the same kind of category as those things? Well, maybe you can't directly observe certain things, but you can infer information about them. So I can measure the charge of a particle in the sense that I can infer what its charge is based on how the things behave. But I can't infer the certainty of what the quantum state of the system <coughs> is by interacting with it. So you can't infer with infinite precision the charge of a particle, and you can't infer with infinite precision yeah. the phase of the analogy of wave function. But people with weak measurements have still done a fairly good job. Although I guess those are only some measurements, but you probably do on some measurements on a bunch of charges if you really want to well, I, I think that's the difference, that uh, although you might say you can never have infinite precision, precision uh, when you're measuring a charge, that with a single shot, rather than an ensemble of preparations of this charge, you can still get arbitrarily good precision. Whereas in the quantum case, if you just have a single sample of the state psi, it's, it's not an issue of not being able to get infinite precision, it's, it's an issue of not being able to get much precision at all. Like there's sort of a, a finite amount of information you can get in a small, rather than so other problems with these postulates. Yes. Yeah, the physical continuity in motion so the collapse of the wave function. Uh-huh. So why is that a problem? Uh, I suppose well, physicists don't like physical continuity <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> so Somebody could defend these postures by saying, well, that's the novelty of quantum theory. You know, previously we didn't have discontinuities, now we do. But um, there's nothing really wrong with that. So it's like, um, whatever changes seems to change instantaneously everywhere, which, although we've shown you can't use it to transmit information, does seem to jar a little bit with um, the idea that nothing can travel faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you could worry about the locality of these changes rather than the locality in space rather than the locality in time. So the discontinuity is kind of surprising, but the fact that it seems to have, have to happen everywhere it might take to be even more surprising than that. There's another weird thing about the discontinuity. I wonder if anyone wants to add to, the, to that point. It sort of it the light. Um, not the one I had in mind, so let me, let me just uh, point out that if, if it's essentially the thing we were talking about before. Um, depending on how I model the measurement, you know, to, do I just treat the, the system or do I treat my whole lab as a quantum mechanical system? So if I treat uh, you know, the, the spin, for example, that I'm measuring as an isolated um, system, sorry, if I treat the, uh, uh, the spin as being measured rather than treating the whole lab, then uh, the state of the spin changes discontinuously according to this postulate. But if I treat the whole lab as my quantum system, including the spin, and I ask how does that whole thing evolve, well that's the unitary evolution postulate and it evolves continuously. 
So just like before, we're saying there seems to be this tension between whether the dynamics is indeterministic or deterministic, depending on how you, how you model it. There also seems to be this conflict between whether it's continuous or discontinuous. Uh, this way of looking at it would say the spin evolves discontinuously. This way it would say it evolves continuously. Okay, um, any other? Uh, I think it's a bit philosophical problem, but uh, like some sort of epistemologic realism, like uh, the thing should get real uh, when we do measurement. Like we cannot uh, talk about a priori reality of what we are interacting. I uh, suppose we uh, isolate our <coughs> system like with some inbuilt failure and <coughs> now, okay, it's uh, deterministically evolving uh, with some interior operations, but when we uh, again interact with it, uh, it's, it's, I don't know, just, we just uh, expose reality, like we just force it to be some bit. So you're saying there's something uncomfortable about the idea that uh, the physical state of the system yes. might depend on how we choose to probe it, things, things like that. Yeah. Yes, like the uh, uh, reality of our quantum object before measurement, a priori reality. I mean, I don't, it seems problematic. The fact that there isn't, uh, for example, any matter of fact about what the outcome of the measurement is going to be before you do the measurement. Mm -hmm. So this objective and determinism, <coughs> you're saying, you could have philosophical issues with the very notion of something that's completely undetermined by what came before. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not something that existed in classical theories. Um, and people do sometimes make arguments that there's something incoherent about the notion of objective determinism. Um, I mean, it, perhaps uh, what you're saying is that it would be nicer in a sense if this was a subjective indeterminism. Maybe you'd say, well, the reason there's this probability distribution of our outcomes is because we're ignorant of something and that probability distribution just expresses our ignorance. Um, it's not, but there's still something in the world in the past that determined what the outcome was. We just didn't know what it was. And that's why there's the probability. Yeah, we'll, we'll be seeing more about that kind of idea. Since the terms continuous and discontinuous, I mean, these are mathematical terms, and you can approximate continuous functions with discontinuous ones, and discontinuous ones with continuous ones. Um, I mean, number three is a sort of loaded statement there where you say it's isolated systems, and if something's isolated, you're not learning anything. Right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, suppose you have a you know, thin half particle, and you have an experimenter, and the experimenter is doing something where he's averaging switches on a field, which can approximate the just as continuous, if you like. Um, but then you put the experimenter on the spin and half particle in the box mm -hmm. uh, and isolate it. So what's going on is inside, if you look, is, is continuous, but actually the evolution itself should be described by some overall Hamiltonian and therefore continuous. Likewise, with the, the final postulate, you say it's a discontinuous change. Mm -hmm. I mean, getting back to physical states, I mean, the first one, you say, well, we, we, we don't observe um, Side. But then again, if you're doing statistics, you don't observe the normal distribution either. Mm -hmm. All you do is you go out and collect as much data to get a histogram. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, if you get new information in, classically, you have to recondition your probabilities and that's the discontinuous jump. Let me address those yeah. two points before so I can't remember. Right, okay. um, so so on, the, on the issue of you know, the, the quantum state can be like a normal distribution, uh, if, if you believe that is the correct analogy, then you would have problems with this. Because this is saying that the, the, the quantum states represent the physical states of the system, so they're not like a normal distribution. They're more like uh, a particular value of the random variable. Well, um, if you had, uh, for instance, I mean, the, the, the word state is very low to do. Sure. Um, if you're doing classical physics, you'd say your state is a quantity in phase space. Right. Um, Which is very I different from a state as a probability distribution or a phase space. Yeah. And so you're saying the fact that it's difficult you to characterize the quantum state, state. state. Right, right. You're saying that you know the fact that you need an ensemble of preparation of the quantum state makes it seem a lot like a probability distribution over the phase space, not like a point in phase space. 
it. So that, I think, would be a, a kind of objection to this first thing, because this is basically saying we should think of the quantum state as like a point in phase space. So you might say, well, that's inappropriate, and that's a problem well, with these postulates. No, um, I mean, you could get this from just looking at the axioms of probability and then saying, well, that's about commutativity. And, and that's fine. Uh, um, I'm just saying that if you do that, then you're really taking a very different view of quantum state than what's expressed here. Um, your second point about uh, continuity and discontinuity, so let me to contrast what happens in the classical case. So, so there might be a change in a classical system that on a coarse grain time scale looks totally discontinuous. Then if I analyze it more closely, I'll say, well, that was just a very rapid change, but it was really continuous at the deeper level. Now the challenge here in the quantum mechanics is that if you try to do that for measurement, you say, well, let's look at that measurement a bit more carefully. Let's not analyze it as just, you know, spin went through the stern girlock apparatus, got an outcome. Let's look at the time when it was moving through the magnetic field, and let's see what its evolution looks like. And you can imagine a Hamiltonian that couples it to the field. But the problem is that when you do that deeper analysis, you're over here. You're, you're looking at unitary, and all you're finding is that that uh, weight function is evolving continuously and deterministically. And so it's difficult to know at what point should you sort of apply this discontinuous change. Because it just seems that any you know deeper analysis of that doesn't find a discontinuity. It's, it's all continuous unitary evolution. I guess my point is there has to be a flow of information before you start doing any conditioning. Um, the flow of information doesn't necessarily have to be discontinuous. Okay, good. So so you could say, uh, and I think, again, this would sort of challenge this sort of uh, picture of quantum mechanics is that this discontinuity should not be thought of as a physical evolution, or, you know, a, a feature of a physical state change. It should be thought of it as like Bayesian updating. It's a feature, a change in our description of a system. It's not a change in the system itself. And so there's no uh, uh, conflict between this and this because here we have different information and these changes of quantum state are just changes in our information. And uh, next lecture, we're going to hear a lot about that sort of idea. So let me open it up maybe for one one more person to let us know if there's some problem. Yes. About the fourth statement, isn't it solved by the coherence theorem? Is it solved by uh, the coherence theorem? The I mean, coherence theorem? Yes. The coherence theory. The continuous. Yep. The collapse, the collapse continues. But we just don't know in which state that you will end. It would be a mixed table results. Uh -huh. um, hold, hold that thought. I'll, I'll come back to decoherence in, in, in a few minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll see if we can solve the problem <coughs> with, with decoherence. Um, all right, let me, let me uh, try to summarize some of the things we've been talking about. So, so the, the first point that came up was um, the term measurement, which appears in these postulates, is, is not defined in terms of more primitive concepts like physical states of the system. Uh, but if you sit, think that a, a measurement is just you know another physical interaction, a measurement device is built out of atoms, there's nothing special about it. Uh, so it's just another kind of physical system, and a measurement uh, interaction is just another kind of physical interaction. So should it be possible to define what a measurement is in those sorts of terms? And so that suggests that you know, we, we should improve on these postulates and we should eliminate measurement as a primitive concept that appears in the postulate and just describe everything in terms of physical states of systems and how they evolve. And so I should be able to tell you how things evolve without telling you, oh, by the way, this is a measurement. You know, you should just be able to infer what the evolution is from, you know, uh, some description of how the atoms are configured, for example. Uh, but there's a, there's a different strategy, uh, which is that maybe the problem is talking about physical states of systems at all. So maybe what we should be doing is eliminating the notion of the physical state of the system as a primitive concept, and instead describe everything in terms of totally operational concepts, like measurements and preparations. So this is, is part of the empiricist tradition in the philosophy of science. So the idea was that uh, we are limited <coughs> to knowing only you know, the, uh, you know, what we can observe. And so you know, the business of science is to you know, relate a certain set of observations to other observations. Our theories should be synopses of the things we observe. Any attempt to sort of go deeper than that in the science of reality is inappropriate. Um, and by focusing on just things we observe, we can hope to have some kind of certainty. So this was the idea of the empiricists and, and the logical positivists. They wanted to make sure that they 
we're not in error by focusing on just uh, statements about observables. And so if you take that perspective, you might say, well, the problem with those postulates is the fact that they made too much of a commitment about what was going on at a microscopic level. They should just pull back and make statements about measurement and preparation. So you've probably seen uh, versions of these two points of view. Uh, so John Bell, for example, uh, is sort of the canonical realist. So here's a quote from Bell. It would seem that quantum theory is exclusively concerned about results of measurements and has nothing to say about anything else. Uh, but what exactly qualifies some physical system to play the role of measurer? And meanwhile, uh, Perez, in his textbook, adopts this operational approach. And he says, in a strict sense, quantum theory is a set of rules allowing the computational probabilities for the outcomes of tests which follow specified preparations. And that's it. That's what quantum theory is. And we shouldn't ask for anything more. Um, so I'm going to say uh, a little bit about you know, each of these two strategies. Um, so. So the realist strategy has the problems that we've been talking about. Uh, so, so we identified actually two inconsistencies of this orthodox approach. So the idea was this, that if we take the collapse postulate and apply it to the system that's being measured, then it looks as if that system state has to evolve indeterministically and discontinuously. But if we take uh, the unitary evolution postulate and apply it to an isolated system that includes the apparatus, we have the system we're measuring, the apparatus, and maybe some part of the environment. Take all of that as our system of interest and say, oh, look, that's isolated, so unitary evolution applies to it. Uh, then the evolution is deterministic and continuous. So in particular, the spin system we're measuring is part of that whole. It would seem to evolve continuously and deterministically as well. So we have this kind of contradiction in uh, what sort of evolution is occurring, depending entirely on how we choose to model things. And that seems wrong. You know, as a physicist, I should be able to decide whether I'm modeling just the system or, or the whole lab. Uh, and it shouldn't make a difference to predictions. So if I'm doing classical mechanics, uh, I could treat you know, a ball bouncing off a wall by treating that wall as an external potential if I like, so I don't assign it any dynamical variable. Or if I want, I can take the wall, assign it a mass and a variable, and see how they interact. And the two pictures will give me essentially the same result. And it's up to me to decide how I'm going to do it. But here, it seems like your choice determines what's actually going on, what your picture uh, of what's happening is. And that's a big problem. Now, there's a second problem, uh, which, which didn't come up in discussion. And I want to go over this, because it's, uh, it's called the quantum measurement problem, and it's the focus of a lot of the discussion in foundations. So we're going to imagine a simple sternger lac measurement. So over here is an oven that spits out uh, neutral at spin. Here is uh, an inhomogeneous magnetic field. And uh, if the atoms pass through that field, then depending on how the spin is oriented in this plane of the magnets, uh, it'll be deflected uh, upwards or downwards. <coughs> and so this, you know, if this is the z direction, this is a measurement of z spin by detecting which, uh, whether the particle came up or down. OK, so, um, so if you treat this whole measurement apparatus externally, so you're not assigning it uh, a Hilbert space and a quantum state, then the postulates just say, you know, if the original quantum state of your spin is A up plus B down, then at the end of the day, uh, you get the up outcome with probability A squared, and you prepare the spin and state up, and similarly, you get down with probability B squared. <laughs> but uh, if you decide to treat the apparatus internally, so you assign it a Hilbert space and a quantum state, uh, then, although that might be very hard to do, because the apparatus might have a lot of degrees of freedom in it, the postulates say that there is some Hilbert space that describes that thing, because it's just a bunch of atoms. Uh, it might be very large, but there's some Hilbert space, and there's some quantum state in that Hilbert space that describes the initial ready condition of the apparatus. And so the initial state of the system and the apparatus is just this tensor product here, up to the system, and the apparatus in some ready state. Uh, and then when you interact them together, when you, you know, run the experiment and the spin moves through, then there's just going to be some unitary that describes that coupling. And again, the postulates say it might be complicated to describe, but there has to be some unitary in the Hilbert space of that composite system that describes the coupling. And that's all we're going to need to assume. And then the final thing is that after that unitary is uh, applied, <coughs> it should be the case that the apparatus changes its state to one that indicates the outcome 
because we've given it a spin that's up along the z-axis. And so this is part of the definition of the measurement working properly. It had better be that at the end, the apparatus tells you that the z-spin was up. If it doesn't, then it means that you haven't got a good measurement of z-spin. Okay, so, uh, so if, it's, if the z-spin's up, then we expect the evolution to take us to this quantum state. If the z-spin is down, we expect to go to this quantum state here. Um, now, here's uh, the key that unitary operators are linear operators, uh, which means that if I take a linear superposition of psi and phi and I act the unitary on it, I get uh, the same linear superposition of the unitary evolute of psi and the unitary evolute of phi. Okay, why is that important? Because if I start my experiment here with this state, A up plus B down, and the apparatus ready, and I apply uh, the unitary that interacts them, and I use linearity, so uh, I have this, so here I've just written, I've distributed the ready state over these two terms, so I'm just applying the unitary to this guy, uh, but I know because of this uh, equation that that must be A times the unitary evolute of this, which is just this guy, and B times the unitary evolute of this, which is just this guy, and so I end up with this entangled state. And uh, all, I really, all I need to assume is uh, unitary evolution and the fact that the apparatus, that the measurement works uh, the way I think it should work. And another problem is that uh, having treated the measurement apparatus internally, this guy doesn't really predict that the apparatus or the spin has any definite properties. So the way you usually ask whether something's well defined in quantum mechanics is you say, is the quantum state an eigenstate of that observable? So does this particle have well defined position? Well, is it an eigenstate of position? If not, then uh, position is not well defined for it. So if you ask, does this spin have, uh, is, is spin along the z-axis well defined for this particle? The answer is no, because if I act with the z-spin operator on this, it's not an eigenstate. So unlike what we had over here, where at the end we expect the spin to be either z-spin up or z-spin down, here we say no, it doesn't, the z-spin is not a property of that particle. And similarly with the apparatus, uh, I can define projectors onto uh, a subspace of Hilbert space corresponding to it, indicating that the outcome is up. And then I can ask, is this quantum state an eigenstate of that projector? Does the apparatus have the property of indicating up? And you'll find the answer is no. Because if I act that projector on this state, I'll get just the first term. So this is not an eigenstate. So, yes? Uh, is, is some kind of considering yourself part of the apparatus because you read the apparatus? So if the apparatus is external, then you're external, you see the apparatus. But if it's internal, you, you can't see <coughs> directly. You know. It. Um, well, I'm not, right now I'm not including any observers in this. I just have sort of the physical system corresponding to the apparatus included in as a sort of dynamical degrees of freedom. And I'm just pointing out that, you know, applying those postulates we saw uh, seems to lead to another contradiction. It's not sort of the determinism versus indeterminism or continuity versus discontinuity, but it's, it's a, a kind of inconsistency between whether the properties of the apparatus and the spin are determinate or not. So in this picture, the spin seems to have definite Z spin, the apparatus seems to have a definite outcome. Whereas in this picture, uh, it seems that y you just have this coherent superposition and neither the spin nor the apparatus has a definite property of being up or indicating up. Uh, so, so what people often do is they, they make this a bit more dramatic by saying, uh, suppose that your apparatus here is hooked up in such a way that after you've got your outcome, you, uh, you know, set in motion these actions that will either kill a cat or let it survive. And now when you try to model that in the formalism, so you assign a Hilbert space to your cat and everything, then you find that you're going to get a superposition at the end that, uh, you know, spin up, apparatus indicates up, cat alive, spin down, apparatus indicates down, cat dead. And then again, you would say, well, the, the life status of the cat is not a determinate property in this approach. And somehow that's supposed to make it even more surprising. But you could argue that, you know, already having pointers not visit, pointing in definite positions is, is surprising enough. Um, okay, so let me, let me come back to a question, a couple of questions about whether this is really a, a problem or not. Um, 
So, so one idea that people have often had is just, look, when you get to that final state, which is this entangled state between the spin and the apparatus, you should just interpret it as disjunction, which is the logician's way of saying, you know, one or the other. So, so we should just interpret this guy as meaning either the spin is up and the apparatus is indicating up, or the spin is down and the apparatus is indicating down, with probabilities a squared and b squared respectively. That's just you know what what we mean by this thing. Uh, but the problem with that is it denies the representational completeness of psi. Remember that was the first postulate we had, which says that psi describes the physical state completely. If you now tell me, oh, this thing actually means that one or another physical state applies, then this object, this mathematical object, does not describe the physical state completely. I have to supplement it with some extra information that says whether the physical state is this or this. So, so although this might be you know, a viable sort of approach, it's definitely not the orthodox approach. It's, it's not a statement that the quantum dis state describes the physical state completely. It denies that. Uh, and what I'm trying to do here is just show you that the orthodox postulates, as they stand, have problems. Um, the second idea is uh, the idea of, of uh, looking at the reduced density operator of the system. So if I have this entangled state between the spin and the apparatus, and I calculate the reduced density operator of the spin, uh, so probably most of you are familiar with the reduced density operator. If not, uh, you might come to it later. Um, and in that case, you find no coherence between, sorry, this is the reduced density operator of the apparatus. You find no coherence between the uh, indicate up and indicate down vectors. And then you can say, well, let's interpret that as either this guy or this guy could be the appropriate probabilities. Um, but again, this doesn't really work because uh, if you say, look, really the apparatus is up, then either you're denying <coughs> your original statement that you know the quantum state was this entangled state. You know, either you're coming along saying, well, really the quantum state was up <coughs> or up, uh, so you're contradicting yourself, or you're denying that psi was a complete representation. Again, you're saying, Look, in addition to saying that this is the quantum state, there's more to be said. That you know, it's really the first term, not, not the second term. So, so these sorts of ideas uh, really take you outside those orthodox postulates. Uh, and I, did I, do I still have that? It, I used to have a slide on decoherence. Let me just say what, uh, uh, what that, that slide contains. If I introduce uh, an environment for my apparatus, I allow it to interact with my apparatus, and I imagine that the environment carries away information about whether the apparatus indicates up or indicates down. Uh, then I have a new entangled state, which has you know, spin up, apparatus indicates up, environment in state one, plus the second term where environment is in state two. Uh, and that will, again, I'll be, if I look at the reduced density operator of the apparatus, I'll get this sort of form. But it really doesn't help avoid this, this problem of denying the representational completeness of psi. If the whole system of apparatus and environment is still in a pure state, involving unitarily, uh, then if I believe that the whole pure state is all there is to say about the physical state, it's, it's uh, not possible to say that really it's in one of the terms without saying that there's something more than the quantum state, without denying the first uh, postulate. OK, um, so let me ask then, given this presentation, we've now seen all the, the different problems, uh, how should we respond? How should we fix the postulates of quantum theory? Simple question. <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm really, I'm not saying what's the definitive answer. What I'm really asking is what strategies you know, what research programs can you sort of identify as ways of, of trying to get out of these sorts of problems? Shut up and calculate. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So you could take the operationalist approach and say the problem with this postulate is that they said anything at all about physical states, and the business of science is to relate, you know, the preparations of the measurements and make predictions, like Asher Perez told us. And so this whole discussion and the measurement problem, we don't need to worry about that. Um, and I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about that approach. Uh, so now let me ask you sort of the, the more refined question. Let's say you, you still uh, endorse this 
realist program. You don't want to just be an operationalist. You, what, what then could you do to try to make sense of the theory? Try to get released by the posture and Sure. Yep. So what's your least favorite postulate? Um, I don't know. I mean, I hate, I guess, I don't have measurement, but then, then you just need the many worlds and I don't really like that either. Or you could try and throw out unitary evolution and then you just have collapse or anything, mm -hmm. which is horribly ugly, but it's a really good state. You can throw out the side. Throw out the side. So like add in variables, you mean something like that? Okay, yep. do is say um, the quantum dynamics, the unitary dynamics, which is typically assumed to be universal, applies, applies to every system in the universe, you can deny that. Um, so for example, you could say, well, certain kinds of systems evolve according to unitary dynamics, other kinds of systems evolve in different ways, maybe in more classical dynamics. So there, were, there have been some ideas of sort of hybrid models with different dynamics for different systems, but that hasn't really gone anywhere. It's very difficult to make these kinds of models work because quantum dynamics and classical dynamics don't really couple together well. So I would say there isn't really any good viable proposals of this sort. Uh, but a different idea is to say uh, the unitary Schrodinger dynamics never applies. It's, it's, it's the wrong dynamics for everything. So you can maintain the notion that there's a single sort of dynamics that applies to all systems equally well. It's just not the unitary dynamics. Uh, and the proposal that people have made is that it's a dynamics that's very similar to unitary dynamics. And in particular, for single microscopic systems, uh, it looks indistinguishable from unitary <coughs> dynamics. But if you have more and more systems, like if you have 10 to the 23 different particles together, that's when it starts looking very different from unitary dynamics. So it's a dynamics that approximates well unitary dynamics for microscopic systems. <coughs> it approximates well the dynamics we see in measurements, the collapse dynamics, for large systems. And so one example is the girardi ramini weber collapse theory, which says that every particle, once every billion years, gets spontaneously localized to a few microns. And the probability of being localized in any given spot depends on the mod squared of the wave function of that particle. So it tends to get localized where the wave function says it is. And then if I'm doing it, uh, you know, interference experiments in my lab and I've got a single particle, well, I'm not going to see this anomalous decoherence due to collapses, because it only happens once every billion years. It's going to have to wait a long time. But if I get, uh, say, you know, 100 particles together and I put them in a Schrodinger cat state where you know, all the particles are here or all the particles are there, and then just one of them collapses, well, the whole wave function collapses. And so, so I, I become sensitive. The more particles I have, the more sensitive I become to these collapses. And so now, because measurement apparatuses are built out of a lot, a lot of particles, and uh, you know, in the in the Schrodinger cat situation, I have many many particles that are in a coherent superposition of different states. A collapse to just one of them reduces the whole wave function. And so that's the sense in which a, a macroscopic system undergoes a very different dynamics under these sorts of proposals. Uh, so so people have, have proposed these sorts of things. They're they're in a way uh, ugly because they don't satisfy energy conservation. They don't satisfy unitarity, uh, but they do. They, they make different predictions from regular quantum mechanics, uh, but those predictions are very hard to uh, test because it's very hard to isolate a large system from its environment. So it's hard to uh, identify this anomalous decoherence uh, from just regular old interaction with the environment um, that, that wouldn't signal collapse. The second uh, idea which we heard was to deny that first postulate, which says that the quantum state uh, is a complete representation of the physical state. So there's two, uh, roughly speaking, you know, two uh, kinds, categories of models of this sort. So these things are typically called hidden variable models when you say there's something more than the quantum state. Uh, and there's a set of hidden variable models that say, well, the quantum state does describe part of the physical state of the system. Uh, it's just it's not everything. So in addition to the quantum state, I need to specify some extra variables as well. And so, for example, uh, Bohmian mechanics 
says that quantum state is part of reality, but then there's also the positions of all the particles. And uh, he tries to make sense of the definiteness of pointer positions and the life states of cats by saying, well, the particle positions pick out that extra information. They tell you which branch of the wave function you're really in. Uh, a different sort of approach, uh, which I call the psi epistemic invariable models, are, are the approach where you say, no, the quantum state really is just a description of your knowledge of some deeper reality. So that deeper reality is the complete description of the physical state. The quantum state is, is, should not be thought of as part of that description, but rather just like a probability distribution over phase space. It captures what you know about the physical state and collapses are like Bayesian updating uh, and we heard a bit about you know why, why this could could be an appealing picture, and, and in the next lecture I'll tell you more about uh, that that kind of picture. Um, you could be more radical and say the whole idea that when you do a measurement you get a unique outcome is somehow wrong. So Everett's uh, view of quantum mechanics is called the relative state interpretation, or sometimes the main world interpretation, says this uh, discontinuous evolution and, and indeterminism is just a subjective illusion. So really, the, the physical state of the universe is the full quantum state, and it goes into these funny entangled states and superpositions. But we as observers uh, have a limited perspective on it, and, and all we see is one branch of the wave function, and so to us, it looks as if things are evolving indeterministically and discontinuously, even though, in fact, they're evolving continuously and deterministically. Um, so this is a, a, an appealing view. Uh, it's, it's kind of similar, in a way, to, to this view here, because it says that um, you know, the quantum states we use when we're describing our experiments aren't really the full quantum state, the real quantum state. They're more just an account of you know, our subjective description of our particular branch of the universe. Um, of course, these sorts of views commit you to some strange things that some people don't like. Um, the fact that you have all these parallel universes and the fact that we're kind of radically deceived about what's going on. Uh, but more than that, they, they have some problems with the interpretation of probability. So according to this view, uh, all possibilities are actual. Um, and, and the trick is, how do we say that you know, it's more likely that I'll get a z-spin up outcome than an x-spin down outcome. In fact, you'll get all outcomes. You know, there'll be some branch of the wave function which every single outcome occurs. And it's not the case in this view that the number of branches in which z-spin up occurs is greater than the number of branches in which z-spin down occurs. It's just that the, uh, the amplitude of a branch is a or it's b, and a squared in regular quantum theory tells us the probability of that outcome. But uh, it's, so, so the question is, why does that measure uh, tell you something about probability in the average interpretation? You know, a counting measure over branches might have made some sense, but this uh, Born measure, it's really not clear why we should interpret that as the probability of observing uh, that's been up. And so, so this is the, the main problem, I would say, with the average interpretation, is how to extract, uh, how to understand probability in that approach. OK, uh, another approach that people have suggested is, is that the problem is with logic or uh, with somehow with epistemology, with our theory of inference. So there's some radical ideas that actually uh, the physics is OK. It's just that we have to change our logic. That's what quantum mechanics teaches us. So you know, an example of uh, the idea of changing logic um, would be classically <coughs> If I tell you that um, the position is x1 or x2 or x3 or x4, etc., that's a true statement. And it's also the case that the momentum is p1 or p2 or p3, etc. Then it follows that uh, you know the position is x1 and the momentum is p1, or the position is x1 and the momentum is p2, and so on. So I can distribute, uh, you know, uh, there's, you can distribute or over and, and vice versa. Uh, and in quantum mechanics, you could deny that. You could say, yeah, it's fine to say that the position is one of its possibilities and the momentum is one of its possibilities. But you can't say that the position is x and the momentum is p. That's, that's not allowed. So that's an <laughs> approach that denies the what's called the law of distributivity in, in logic. 
Uh, and so people have thought a lot about these sorts of approaches, and they're not, uh, I wouldn't say they're very popular, but it's, it's an idea for how you might fix things up. Uh, and these days there's also a lot of people, uh, like Chris Fuchs, for example, and I put myself in this category these days, who think that maybe what we need to do is somehow change um, the theory we use to describe inference, so when you want to update your knowledge in the face of uncertainty. So we typically use Kafka probability theory to say, well, if uh, I have a certain amount of information, I represent my degrees of belief by a probability distribution, and then I can use things like Bayes' rule to update those probabilities when I get new data. So there's a whole mathematical formalism, and people have even tried to derive that formalism from certain axioms about the way uh, knowledge works. But you could say, well, uh, maybe quantum theory teaches us that we're doing it wrong, and there's some other alternative theory for how you should describe your knowledge, which isn't possible for the theory. Uh, and then finally, you could deny some other implicit feature of this framework that we're working in. So remember, we're, we're, this is a whole discussion where we want to sort of maintain realism somehow. We don't want to be operationalists. Uh, and there's always some possibility that there's some implicit assumption that we're not really recognizing, uh, and it's that assumption that's mistaken. Okay, um, so that was the realist strategy, where you, you know, stick to your guns and you say, quantum mechanics should tell us about what's going on in reality. Uh, we should simply be empiricists. But now let's see the other side of the coin. Let's say. Uh, you think the problem with the postulates was that they talked about physical states of systems, and really they should just talk about measurements and preparations and what you see in the lab. But well, what are you going to do then? Uh, so take this uh, stirring gerlach experiment again, uh, and now imagine that the preparation is just represented by some box that has an output aperture and a little button that sets things going, and then measurement half of things is another box where you know, I can feed systems in, and then a little pointer that just tells me what the outcome is. Uh, so for an operationalist, uh, they could say, well, the right way to interpret the forms in quantum mechanics is uh, you know, not as a description of the properties of the system, but just as a, an encoding of what you've done in the lab to prepare the system. So you have some preparation procedure inside this box, which involves you know, doing whatever, maybe building a laser and, and turning it on. And all that this uh, vector in Hilbert space represents is, is that the details of that preparation procedure. So it's just a uh, preparation procedure is a list of instructions of what to do in the lab, and the quantum formalism tells you for every possible list of instructions of what to do in the lab, how to represent it as a vector in open space. And then similarly, uh, a measurement procedure over here, which is another list of instructions of what to do, at the end of it gives you some outcome. Well, that, uh, according to this view, is represented by some Hermitian operator. And that's all these things represent. Uh, they don't have any greater status than that. And then in this view, the, the, the purpose of a theory is just to predict the probabilities of outcomes of experiments. So you just want to know what's the probability of getting outcome k of this measurement, given that I did some preparation and I did some measurement. And quantum mechanics tells you it's just the expectation value of the projector associated with the kth outcome. Um, so that's the, the operational approach that all the formalism is doing is it's a catalog of expectations uh, of what you'll see in experiments. Um, so you might hope to you know, re-describe the postulates in this sort of way. Uh, you have to add a few other things. You have to say, for example, what happens after a measurement. So in this approach, you say, look, if I do a preparation and I have a measurement and the system survives, right, there's an output port to that measurement, then I can think of this whole pair as a new preparation. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a new list of instructions of what you might do in the lab. And the instructions say, do preparation procedure P, uh, uh, then do this measurement, and if you get outcome K, uh, let the system go to the next stage. So that's an effective preparation, PK. And so you might say, well, what is the vector that represents that effective preparation? Because we know the vector that represents the first preparation, we know the Hermitian operator rep represents this guy, and that's where this uh, collapse postulate comes in. in. In this view, it just says psi K, which is the projected version of psi, is the vector you use to describe this effective preparation. And that's all the significance that it has. Oh. Yes? I'm, I wonder if you can say why I, I might be worried about um, whether full knowledge of the preparation procedure can really define psi uniquely or not. 
Um, so is your worry that sometimes I might want to assign a mixed state rather than a pure state, or? I, I, I'm not quite clear what my worry is, but it seems to, it doesn't, it's not obvious to me that that's the case, that you know, just because I know what I, what I did, right. that I can assign a side. Right, um, so I guess in this view, the idea is that, you know, if you know quantum mechanics well, then you have this kind of an algorithm for saying, you know, here, here's, here's what I've done in the lab. Uh, and, you know, somebody who's a, a good practitioner would say, right, I analyze that, and I can tell you exactly what vector and Hilda space to use to, to, to describe that preparation. So that's sort of a, an art. There's a lot of skill that goes into doing that translation from the experimental setup to what, what vector you're preparing. Um, you, you could ask the other question, you know, is it the case that for every vector in the Hilda space, you can find some setup that will implement that, that vector, some preparation which is represented by that vector. And uh, you know, these days it's sort of clear how to do that. Like, you know, quantum computation has taught us how to implement, you know, an arbitrary unitary with a certain gate set. So, so, you know, in the beginning, I think people were a little bit unclear on whether that was possible. But now I think it's pretty clear that for any mathematical high object that I write down in Hilbert space, like a unitary, there's some setup that will implement it similarly for, for a state. So what guarantees that um, things are unique be the side or the preparation of the There's not more than one preparation procedure. No, is, there is more than one preparation procedure for a given size. So there's a huge equivalence class of preparations that all correspond to the same size. So a simple example would be if I want to prepare a horizontally polarized photon, I could use a birefringent crystal, I could use a piece of Polaroid, I could do it lots of different ways. Those I would say, those are different lists of instructions of what to do in the lab. They're all represented by the same vector. Yeah. I don't the other one. Yeah. Uh, do you mean, could there be two different quantum states that are represented by the same preparation yeah. procedure? Yeah. So you can't have that because, you, you can't have that and, and uh, okay. so I'll say it again. And for two different vectors in the Hilbert space, like you know, pointing in different directions, there's always some measurement that gives different statistics for those two guys. If those two guys are represented by the same preparation procedure, then it would have to give the same statistics <coughs> for those two measurements, contradicting the predictions of quantum theory. So that's why two quantum states pointing in different directions in the space always have to be associated with different preparation procedures. Okay, I should I should, uh, I should end. Um, let me just uh, make a couple of comments. Uh, it's, you know, so now this is. A transformation procedure which is associated with the unitary, same sort of idea. We interpret the unitary as just representing what we've done in the lab. And then uh, the problem with this sort of approach is that it, it's not really quite general enough. So I'm not going to go over this, but the, the more general kinds of representations of preparation procedures are density operators, not pure quantum states. So not vectors in Hubble space, but positive trace one operators on Hubble space. Uh, and I'm not going to go through why you need density operators. Hopefully you guys have seen that before. Um, and I'll skip this. Uh, the, the measurements are not always associated with the Hermitian operator. Sometimes, uh, well, first of all, I can say that rather than writing down a Hermitian operator, it's sufficient to write down the projectors onto its eigenspaces, which is some call it, it's called a projection value measure. But uh, in general, you need, this should say positive, not position. It should say, in general, you need a positive operator value measure. So this is a set of positive operators to represent your, your measurement. And then your probabilities are calculated just by trace row times the PPM. Um, okay, so, so you get a similar thing for these effective preparations. They're also represented by density operators. And then you can sort of look at the maps that take you from the density operator to this guy, the effective density operator. They're not just unitaries, they're a broader class of things. Um, they're called completely positive uh, trace preserving linear maps. And so the point is that you, you end with the following picture, which is that you can replace those postulates we saw earlier, which referred to the physical state of the system and how it evolved, with a totally operational version of the postulates. You see, every preparation procedure P is associated with the density operator rho. So I haven't said anything about the physical state of the system. Every measurement is associated with a positive operator value measure. The probability of getting outcome K is just given by the formula. <coughs> Every transformation is associated with a trace-preserving completely positive linear map. Every measurement outcome is associated with a trace-non-increasing completely positive linear map. 
such that the density operator evolves in this particular way when you get that outcome. So this is a set of postulates that just says, if you're going to the lab and you're doing some experiments, this is how you should model things, and it'll allow you to predict the probabilities of what you get. Uh, so anyway, that's, if, if you want to be an operationalist, if you don't care about realism, then there's no problem. You can just use these sorts of postulates, and yeah, you can do fine. Um, but let me just leave you with uh, this question. Uh, is it really satisfactory to only have this minimal interpretation of quantum theory? Um, so many people say it's not, and that's uh, what the next lecture will be about, trying to go beyond that. Let me end there.